He is an agent from Impactful and Positive Change. He was an appointee at the Michelle Lujan Grissom Administration as a special assistant. Following that, we have served in the uh, legislature since 2019 as a policy analysis and recently as a bill drafter in the past session. His community efforts include contributing to the state's version of the Crown Act, the Black Edu Educational Act, and the New Mexico Diversity Act. He is currently working with the plaintiffs of the consolidated Yahtzee Martinez lawsuit representing black inclusion in the future remedies ordered by the second judicial district. As the owner of the Watson and Association International LLC, he has represented levels of the government in New Mexico, Du Zambia, and Instanting International Agreement, served as a trade representative in New Mexico, Trade Alliance, and now working with the Albuquerque Community Safety Department as a special assistant. Alongside Devante's community involvement, he is a musician and Metropolitan Church of God in Christ as an organist. Lastly, he is the grant writer for Wings for Life. So everybody may welcome Mr. Devante. So all the kids say hi to Miss Margie for arts and crafts. You guys can head with Margie to arts and crafts. How's everyone doing? Said, so how's everyone doing? That's all right. I'm a little, I'm a shorter brother, so I got to lower this down a little tad. I'm not goose. <laughs> so um, thank you all for having me this evening. I'm the grant writer for Wings for Life, and today's um, discussion is going to hopefully be insightful to you, and it will be uh, educational as it regards to the levels of government in the state of New Mexico, how to engage civically, and how to be a civically engaged citizen that contributes back to society. Here are today's ob objectives. One is we're going to ascertain knowledge and the importance of civic education. Secondly, to realize personal empowerment. Thirdly, to identify community issues in New Mexico. So I know some of us have hats on. We're going to wear a couple of hats today uh, in regards to us uh, actually articulating and thinking about issues in our community and how to take action on them. Lastly, to understand New Mexico government. Before we go any further, I would like to just say thank you to those who greeted me when I came in, to all the familiar faces, and to all the new faces. Uh, it's certainly a pleasure to be here, uh, contributing back to Wings for Life, such a great organization. Just give a round of applause for Wings for Life International. With the spirit of Langston Hughes, he says, I too am America. Here's a quote by Aristotle. But for one factor of liberty is to govern and to be governed in turn. For the popular principle of justice is to have equality according to number, not worth. And one is for a man to live as he likes. For they that this is the function of liberty inasmuch as to live not as one likes is the life of a man that is a slave. So the definition of democracy comes from a Greek term, demos kratos. Demos meaning the people. Kratos meaning the power, the governing factor, or to rule. So when I say demos, kratos, that means both of these terms in conjunction with one another. 
Who rules? Well, the people ought to rule. So when I say demos, y'all say kratos. Demos. Demos. Y'all got it. So today's subject, what is civic engagement? Let's make this a call and response. If you have questions, just feel free to lift your hands in the air. This is going to be very interactive, very informal, uh, so that it's comfortable for you. Uh, hopefully you know a little bit about me by that bio. Thank you, uh, Keith, for reading it. I'm just a real person. I've had a lot of uh, opportunities to work in the community at very high levels. Uh, at the end of the day, I'm still Devante from the block. All right? Amen? Amen? <laughs> so civic engagement means working to make a difference in the civic life of our communities and developing the combination of knowledge, skills, values, and motivation to make that difference. It means promoting the quality of life in a community through both political and the non-political process. Another definition reads, a morally and civically responsible individual who recognizes himself or herself as a member of a larger social fabric and therefore considers social problems to be at least Partly, just at least partly, his or her own issues, such as an individual who is willing to see the moral and civic dimensions of issues to make and justify an informed moral and civic judgment and to take action when appropriate. Last definition mentioned that these are two definitions that offer just a different vantage point of what civic engagement means. Thank you so much for your question. And uh, just uh, for our virtual audience, um, if you do have a, do we have a second microphone? Let's have a floating microphone. Uh, so um, if someone does have a question, just state your name for our virtual audience so that they are uh, fully in tune with the discussion. Thank you so much for your question. All right, so civic education, which is what we will be dealing with today. Civic education means global and critical thinkers through awareness, intuitive citizens, people who shape our community, people who exercise democracy and provide feedback to community leaders. Here's just a little model of what civic engagement uh, explains and explicates. Four constructs of civic engagement. Civic action, civic commitment or duty, civic skills, and social cohesion. Uh, for time's sake, I'm going to uh, not read every bullet point. Can everyone see it? Everyone can see it? Awesome. And I can make this available afterwards for anyone who would like to uh, review this. Can civic engagement hold, civic engagement education holds power? Let me just kind of gauge the room here. Yes or no? Indifferent. Can civic education hold power? Okay, so I'm giving. I'm getting a lot of yeses in the room, all right. Well, we could see through history that civic education empowerment has. This was in Florida and how students led to lead the country in a discussion for policy regarding school safety. Well, if we're individuals, what perspective do we have? What perspective did we bring here today? Well, we all belong to different communities. Dr. Crenshaw out of Los Angeles would argue that many of us have multiple identities.
for some of you, if you didn't notice, I'm black. <laughs> I'm also a man. So those interlaying identities cause what's called intersectionality, and those inform us and make our identity or the fabric of our identity unique. That's what Dr. Crenshaw says out of UCLA. So what discourse communities do you belong to? Just kind of throw them out there, discuss them at your table. You may belong to a church, fraternity, school clubs. I'll give you 20 more seconds to discuss that. Think a little bit deeper. Think a little bit deeper. What discourse communities do you belong to? Five more seconds, five more seconds. So many of you probably heard many identities and many communities that we belong to that you may not even see at the surface. Am I correct? Church communities, sororities. There's a common community that we share here, that's Wings for Life International. But if we dig a little bit deeper, thinking through Dr. Crenshaw's view of intersectionality, we all carry multiple identities, and those impact a lot. It impacts a lot. So why is civic education important? Well, these are just a couple examples throughout history of, while, of how civic education formed into movements became power. Frederick Douglass. He was an abolitionist who gave movement to what ultimately Abraham Lincoln signed into law as the Emancipation Proclamation. We have the women's movement. Also, uh, this individual right here was also a part of the women's movement. Mass meeting, women's suffrage. We see how civic education then evolves into empowerment and empowerment into power. So not only is civic education important, it holds power. No matter where you are, no matter what creed, no matter what color, civic education, and as my brother right here said, education holds power. And responsibility, all right. And we're going to talk about that responsibility a little later. And here's a little bit more ab about how civic education empowerment translates to power. This is the ci various pictures of the civil rights movement. You see here Dr. King meeting with the president of the United States. But those who were empowered were on the streets marching for rights marching for justice, marching for equality, which then translated into the Voting Rights Act, huh? the Civil Rights Act. So this education holds a lot of power, even contemporary movements of today. You may not agree with them all. You may not agree with them all. You may agree with them all. You may agree with some, but the thing is about this power is that it's galvanized enough people to create a conversation here in our country, to then create a conversation about what can we do to progress humanity, progress people in our country. You know, uh, before I go even further, I told you, uh, before I, well, it wasn't in my bio, but uh, I'm, a I'm a son of a minister's kid. I'm what you call a preacher's kid. <laughs> I'm a PK. <laughs> so uh, I may preach a little bit to y'all, but uh, uh, each generation had a responsibility. You know, first it was 
One of the first was establishing the country, the United States of America, abolishing slavery, huh? the women's suffrage, the civil rights movement, the Voting Rights Act, huh? Putting a man on the moon. There is something that each generation is called to do. My question is, what have we been called to do today to make that change and make our difference? That's a hypothetical question. Don't answer it now. So what about New Mexico? Before we go any further, I think I <laughs> there's a couple slides that are missing. Um, hopefully it's still in here, and if... I speak about it now, we'll just skip over it. How many of y'all know, know the First Amendment? First Amendment, there's five components towards it. First person that get it, gets it right, I'll give you an extra slice of pizza. <laughs> okay, okay, if you, if you think that you have it, uh, uh, don't, don't, don't give the answer to anyone else because you're gonna miss out on your slice of pizza. <laughs> So if you think you have it, raise your hand and grab the mic. Five components, five components towards the First Amendment. No, you must recite it all. Five components to the First Amendment. Let me make sure I don't have these in here. Okay, yeah. Okay, so it is in here. So just begin, okay, I, just think about it. Just think about it. Don't tell your neighbor. Don't tell your neighbor at all because uh, it's later on in the slide. I just found it. So what about New Mexico? One of the things that I'm charged with uh, as an African-American in the state of New Mexico, who, by the way, and you have to read some of my op-eds, did you know that you know, you, some of you all read the 1619 Project by the New York Times? Well, I argue that before Jamestown, Virginia, there was already a colony of Europeans who had settled in a part of the United States dating before 1619, some 200 years before, with African slaves. So I'm not calling them right or wrong. I'm just calling out the truth, calling out the history. And you could read my op-ed if you would like. I have my business cards. You could go to my website, and it's also on a, one of these slides. Uh, before 1619, there was a colony called Santa Fe <laughs> who traversed across the state of New Mexico, Estevan the Moor, who was enslaved by Europeans. So I'm charged to study the impacts of that dating before 1619. What are those impacts in the state of New Mexico? How does that in impact culture in the state of New Mexico. So for that reason, as mentioned uh, by Goose, I have helped write, draft, analyze, and produce what's called the Black Education Act in the state of New Mexico, which is now the law of the land. Uh, also the Crown Act, which is an anti-discrimination bill based on culturally based hairdresses or headstyles I have cornrows. That means simply that an employer cannot discriminate against me for having culturally expressed hair. So I look at a lot of data as an economist. So here's some data just depicting the African American experience. And in our uh, exercise, you don't have to necessarily use this data. You could get on your phone, or maybe you have available data that you already know. But this is the population of African Americans in the state of New Mexico based on recent and most available data. Uh, we are roughly about 3.1% of the population. However, 70,000 registered voters, which could swing an entire election economic statuses of African Americans, so on, health statuses of African Americans, incarceration statuses 
of African Americans. Disproportionate. A lot of these figures are disproportionate. Education status. By the way, a lot of these are social determinants of health. Something that has the ability to predict the propensity of the prosperity of individuals. So with that data, I study that all day. Maybe you have your data. Maybe you could look at, get on your phone and look at some data. I want, there's a piece of paper at each table. There's two, there should be two pieces of paper and pens. So I want every table to identify a scribe. Somebody who's going to jot down notes. Yes, the scrinographer. <laughs> Has everyone identified and describe at your table? All right, now that we have identified a scribe, I need that scribe to do one thing. I hope your scribe knows how to draw. <laughs> I need you to do a good job and draw this big on your paper. Just draw a tree. So basically what you need, you need roots, and I need you to make a big trunk, a big trunk, and then make the, you know, the leaves. <laughs> I'll give you 30 seconds. Doesn't have to be perfect. I, we just need to get the concept across. And then what we're going to do is an activity with this tree. Fifteen more seconds. <laughs> Ten seconds. All right, hold up your trees. You win, you win, you win, you win, you win. Round of applause, round of applause. <laughs> so what we're going to do, and I, I do this all the time, especially in the multiple hats that I wear, is it's called a root cause analysis. So basically what we're going to do is Maybe it's the data or maybe some of the concepts that we've spoken about already have allowed you to articulate some of the issues in your community. So I want you to, for 30 seconds, we're on a time crunch, so I'm being respectful of the time. <laughs> I want you to articulate some of the community issues in your community. 30 seconds. Just throw them out there. Throw, don't write it down yet. Don't write it down yet. Just toss it out, and then what I want you to do is the number one, or whatever you vote on at each table, all right, I mean, it's democracy, we need one. Each table needs one problem that you're going to identify. So I need you, if, if you have a lot of them, vote on it and arrive at one. I'll give you a minute and a half.
minutiae goes. You know that redwood trees have a very shallow root system? Redwood trees? Okay. And what, what makes them hold together is interlocked roots. Unity is strength. They interlock roots together. That's how they hold each other up. Especially when you're talking trees, the 350 foot trees. Wow. That's interesting. So, time is up. I need the scribes to give me a thumbs up if you have arrived at your issue area from each table. What about this table right here? This table right here, the orange one, or have you, are you good? Okay. This table, this table, this table, this table. Okay, good. So, what I need you to do is write down. I need you to write down that issue that you have identified and just put it in the trunk. Write it, list it right here. List it right here. Are we done? So what about this table? What did you write down? Addiction, this table. Youth safety, this table. Crime. Crime, this table. Breakdown of the family and this table. Yeah. Okay, crime. Because no, because what we're going to do, we're going to have different outcomes, hopefully. So, th again, this is called the root cause analysis. So, since we have labeled our tree, there are roots that contribute into the makeup of that tree. This is called the root cause analysis. So in your roots, you may uh, need to draw some more roots, but I want you to list out what the contributing factors are to that trunk that grows the tree. Yes, so for, e and just start to write them down in the, in the, roots so you have another minute Thirty more seconds, thirty more seconds. And time. So each table just kind of shout out maybe one or two of the root causes this table mental health lack of health care and homelessness this table guns and drugs how about this table addictions and poverty and this table back here Lack of godly values and drugs and alcohol. Faith is a big factor in this table right here. Gun access, unemployment, and broken families. So lastly, in this root cause analysis, we've identified the trunk. We've identified the contributing factors that feed the tree. Maybe there are apples or oranges up here, I don't know. But what are the fruits of the tree? What does it cause? So start to list it out. 
start to list it out right here. What are the outcomes of that? What are the fruits of your tree? What are the fruits of your tree? And time. So, what are some of the fruits of your tree? Let's uh, let's let's get the microphone. I'm sorry. List your list the name of your. So, what we're gonna do? We're gonna list the name of your trunk so we remember, and then the fruits of your. So, addiction yeah. is our trunk, and helplessness. Confusion, crime, addicts, broken homes, unemployment. Thank you. One more. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next table. We said youth safety. Uh, we have. Um, Speak just a little bit louder. Can you hear me? Yeah. Generational trauma, incarceration, school shootings. Uh, Youth safety or unsafety. Continue. <laughs> uh, economic breakdown, generation, generational trauma, incarceration, school shootings. Thank you for sharing. And how about this table? Uh, prison carcer, uh, carcer, uh death, breakdown in family units, uh, segregation. Isolation. Thank you. Thank you. And how about this table? Our trunk is declining nuclear family, it leads to homelessness, mental health issues, unemployment, depression, crime, violence, drugs, and addiction. Thank you. And last but not least, this table here. Can you use the microphone, please? I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, with our trunk is crime and we put family separating, imprisonment, sin, no values, broken society, and death. Thank you so much for sharing. So as you could see, there's a common thread with this root cause analysis. And let me just tell you what you just did. You did work that uh, professors do. <laughs> this root cause analysis, because sometimes we try to band-aid the fruits, the outcomes, right? Homelessness, mental health. But when we go just a little bit deeper, we got to figure out what it is that we're actually dealing with, which is the trunk. When we go just a little bit deeper, that's the root cause of what we're dealing with in our communities. And oftentimes, we treat the symptoms. We put a Band-Aid over it. We don't actually treat the root cause to cut the tree at the root. So that's what civic engagement education does. And through that type of power, we have the ability to cut the tree of our problems of our community at the root. So why is 
it important to be civically engaged? Well, what ways can we be civically engaged? Well, there's political participation, protesting, something as simple as reading the newspaper, writing letters to our community leaders, joining civic organizations, learning about current events, and last but not least, one of my favorite, which is voting. So what are the laws in our toolkit when it comes to being civically engaged? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> What's the First Amendment? I asked you this before. So anyone that has, don't use your phone, I, I, because you know, before we go into this, ex before we go into answering this, did you know that one third of Americans know of the First Amendment but don't know it fully? When it's the ultimate tool in our toolkit for becoming and actively participating civically. I believe, so state your name and list out the components of the First Amendment. Oh, hopefully I'm not wrong, but my name is Ryan Rocha. Uh, if I remember correctly from high school, uh, it's uh, freedom of speech, freedom of press, uh, freedom of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Is that, is, am I close? You, the life, liberty, and pursuit of it, happiness it, it, is the it, preamble it, of the Constitution. It, 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 yes, right. <laughs> but you, you, so you had two, you had okay. two fifths right. I lost. No pizza for me. <laughs> but those are important values that are in our preamble that each person is definitely guaranteed. Okay. All right. Uh, that we are guaranteed. Did I get an amen? Amen. All right. <laughs> to add to it, it's freedom of religion. And uh, you got to recite them all. Okay. I'm sorry. Free, uh, freedom of speech, free, freedom of religion, freedom of the press. Uh, and uh, uh, the right to assemble, and the right to petition. He gets sex for pizza. <laughs> exactly right. So these are the. I keep my mouth shut when I have to. So everyone remember this. Everyone remember this because when it comes to, when it came to the civil rights movement, they were infringing a lot upon the First Amendment, which is why we saw a lot of Supreme Court cases dealing with the First Amendment, particularly around this one. Did you know MIMP in Tennessee, it was illegal for more than an X number of African American or black folks to gather together? This type of meeting that we're having here today would be declared illegal in a certain time frame. Can you believe that? Somebody ought to clap for the First Amendment. So we also have the Voting Rights Act, which is in our toolkit. No voting qualification or prerequisite shall be applied by any state to abridge voting due to race or color. Courts may suspend any voting qualification it finds that are used for racial discrimination. We find that with the conversation of gerrymandering nowadays. Federal officials appointed to hear all registration and participation complaints and the AG to provide examiners to govern voter registration. This is all covered in the Voting Rights Act. So now that we have understood a little bit about the importance of civic engagement, the importance of some of the tools in our toolkit, we're actively thinking about some of the issues in our communities, well, Someone look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, what about New Mexico? This is where I live. This is where I live. <laughs> so we're just going to go over an overview of the various levels of government in the state of New Mexico. That deals with the county, the municipal, and the state. The county is an extension of the state. Municipal governments, municipalities are incorporated governments metropolises or cities. And then we have the state, which is governed by the state constitution. So a city or municipal government, which 
is an incorporated government for local provisions, decision making, and public service, mostly urban. The charter is what's known as the uh, city constitution. Some of the responsibilities are listed here. And you'll notice a difference between the city and the county. Sometimes they have shared uh, responsibilities, like for example, here in Bernalillo County, the libraries are a shared responsibility. It's actually called the Albuquerque Bernalillo County Library System, for example. Just a little bit more, and then the forms of municipalities. We actually heard this in Albuquerque <laughs> this year because there was a discussion about changing how the city operates. And currently we have a strong mayoral council where the mayor is elected at large and has the power to hire and fire department heads. The mayor has the power to veto the council actions. And the mayor has budgetary power, which is to plan for raising and spending city money. And the mayor sets the agenda for the council. This is what we have currently in the city of Albuquerque. Now, again, cities vary depending on their charter and depending on how what the charter is considered their constitution. That all depends on how they are chartered. This is just a diagram of a strong mayoral council where the voters directly elect the mayor and the city council, who then the mayor appoints through the approval of the council the department heads. Whereas a weak mayoral council, the mayor's position is weak because the office shares an appointive and removal of power of city personnel, power is ultimately decentralized. The mayor is no more powerful than any other member of the city council. This is what the motion was to move Albuquerque to, uh, and it was not passed. This is an example of the weak mayor council where voters directly elect the mayor and city council and other city officials, and that the council appoints the department heads. Then there's the city manager. Uh, city manager type of city government where the mayor and the city council make decisions after debate on policy issues such as taxation, budgeting, annexation, and services. Most city managers exert strong influence on these matters. This is, a count, this is a model of how the city manager works where the voters elect the mayor and the council and then both elect the city manager who then in turn uh, elects the department heads, or excuse me, appoints the department heads. So this is how the city of Albuquerque is currently broken down. I'm sorry, this is a little old. Yeah, you may see Ken Sanchez there. That was actually my city councilor who's gone on to glory. <laughs> now he has a chamber named after him. But this is ultimately how this city of Albuquerque is structured under the strong mayoral system. County government, something completely different, which is, again, an extension of state government. Through elected officials, it administers and enforces state laws, collects taxes, assesses property, records public documents, and conducts elections, issues licenses as well. Uh, for sake of time, I'm going to kind of skip through these, but a typical county government looks something like this, and this is actually how county government is structured in Bernalillo County, so I'll give you a couple seconds to look at this, where voters directly elect the county board and other officials who then the county board elect, or excuse me, appoint uh, the county officials. This is how a commission works, just a basic model. 
where the city commissioner, or county commission rather, appoints the department heads. And this is how, a little outdated, <laughs> again, but this is the structure of Bernalillo County. Some of the people, some of the folks are still there, I think. Yeah, I know, I know her, Treasure Burks. <laughs> So state government consists of the executive branch, the legislature, and the judiciary. State government is governed by the state constitution as its governing document. The state government has an executive branch consisting of the governor, lieutenant governor, secretary of state, attorney general, state auditor, and commission of public lands. Interestingly enough, all of these individuals in the executive branch are independently elected based on their own merits in the state of New Mexico. So that means if you vote for one, it doesn't impact the other. You have to independently vote for, with an exception of the lieutenant governor. Otherwise, all the others are independently elected. The executive branch, to uh, the governor is the chief of executives, submits the budget, enforces law, commander in chief of the state's military, and serves four years in the state of New Mexico with a maximum of two terms. This is a look of the governor's cabinet. Actually, there's one more that needs to be added, which is now the um, Department of, not special education, the the uh, early childhood learning, early childhood development department, thank you. The lieutenant governor, here are the responsibilities, which is to provide over, preside over the Senate, serves as the acting governor when the governor is out of the state, provides constituent services, serves as a member on boards, councils, and has four year terms which is not restricted. Secretary of State oversees the elections. Ethics regulator, as of 1993, per the New Mexico, and the registrar for companies, corporations, and nonprofit organizations. So if you want to start an LLC, you got to talk to the Secretary of State. The Attorney General, who is responsible for prosecuting and defending state interests in the Supreme Court and Court of Appeals, in which the state is a party of, represent the state in all other courts and tribunals of, of the state's interests, serves four-year terms. This is actually capped, two terms. State Auditor performs, authorizes, and supervises audits, financial affairs, and state of local government serves four-year term, serves at four-year terms. And then the commissioner of public lands. And, and, and I hope that you're understanding the importance of going over all these because set one, why would we talk about the commissioner of public lands? Well, we all know that the lands in the state of New Mexico that New Mexico holds are actually being sold for educational purposes for early childhood. It's called the, the rainy day fund. So this is, listen, administers nine million acres of land surface, admis, administers three million acres of beneficiaries of New Mexico land, optimizes revenue, protects health of the land, two four year terms. This person has a lot of power, especially in the state of New Mexico because the lands have been sold to produce um, educational outcomes as it pertains to our public education department. This is kind of a messy slide, but this is an overview of state government. Uh, and then there's the legislature. Senate has 42 members. House of Representatives has 70. Presiding officer, speaker of the House. Uh, by the way, if you want to run, I think the Congress is looking for one, so put in your resume. <laughs> that was a joke. Y'all can laugh. <laughs> oh, I cracked myself up. <laughs> Presiding officer of the Senate is the lieutenant governor, elected chamber, uh, chamber leader is the Senate pro temp. Judicial. 
So this is important. How do we impact the courts? You don't have to go to law school to impact the courts. We elect those folks. We elect the people that adjudicate on our behalf. So we have the Supreme Court, Court of Appeals, district courts, magistrate courts, and probate courts. So we directly impact the results that we see. It's called retainment. Just an overview of the courts. Um, here's my info, but ultimately, give us the ballot. Look at your neighbor and say, give us the ballot. Because Demos, y'all forgot, Demos caught those. Demos. Demos. So get registered today, Mexico Secretary of State or your local county clerk. Um, just a little, before I leave, I have two updates. It is now 726. Here are some important deadlines coming up for New Mexico local elections. So voter registration deadline is tomorrow. So this is a timely presentation. If you are not registered, what are you gonna do tomorrow? Where? Oh, amen. Mother has it going. Ha, <laughs> all right, all right. So if you are not registered, we have a, are you a voter registration agent? If you're not registered, you can sign up right now. Somebody ought to give a round of applause. Also, if you need to update your voter registration, you know where to go. If you move from the east side to the west side, or the west side to the moving on up, you know, <laughs> if you're moving on up to the east side, uh, you may need to update your voter registration, and you know where to go to. Um, absentee ballots, to request that, the deadline is October 24th. So if you don't want to go in person, like me, I don't want to see them people, <laughs> uh, request your absentee ballot by October 24th. The absentee ballot return deadline is November 7th. Early voting available is October 10th, which is tomorrow. So you can start voting as early as tomorrow. Uh, there is some turnaround time, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, if we register to vote to get your information all uploaded, but ultimately, register. I'm not telling you who to vote for, I'm just telling you to vote. Then we have the city elections. Uh, the deadlines are right here. Again, I could send you this information, but the last thing in my short amount of time up here is House Bill 4. Yes, we have a question. Can you get the mic, please? Can felons vote? Can, hold on. That's what I'm going to talk about. You're, uh, okay, I'm going to answer your question right now. Any other questions before I continue? Any other questions? So I heard your question, heard your question. I'm going to talk about it right now. What if you've never, ever voted and you are a felon? If you never ever voted and you're a felon, you need to register. And I have good news. House Bill 4, Javier Martinez, who worked alongside with him, he's the Speaker of the House. Gail Chasey, who's actually the uh, chairwoman of the Judicial Committee, a very powerful committee. Katie Duhigg, Senator, they have passed a law which went into effect July, what's the fiscal year in? Ju Ju June, so July 1st of this year, thank you, um, which is when most laws go into effect in the following fiscal year, relating to elections, emitting and enacting automatic voter registration updates to registration provisions, repealing and replacing driver's license voter registration provisions. There's a lot contained in this bill. I could go down and give you my analysis. It's like, you just set the session, but ultimately, Felons can vote when you return as a citizen. So it is important to get out there and vote, to voice your concerns to 
elected officials because something as simple like that. Voicing your concerns, say, hey, I'm still a citizen. I'm, I, still, <laughs> I still pay taxes, huh? Uh, I want to vote. So that's how this came about. So we ought to be thankful in New Mexico because we have very progressive laws that are even more changing and evolutionizing for the betterment of our communities. But that's a really big update. Without any further ado, I did have one more activity. I told you I could hop forever, preach forever, <laughs> go forever uh, on, on singing. But um, I thank you all so much for having me. One more question, and then we'll uh, break and give it to Goose. Can you, can you get the? Yes, um, I'm Sarah Rogman, AKA Sister Sarah. Prison reform person and volunteer in corrections as well, and other things, former teacher, former engineer. But it is important that the person who has gotten released, you're supposed to be, they had some stipulations. This actually started over 20 years ago with the NACP, but things you know, didn't quite go, but it's now done. So, number one, you need to have your person to make sure that their PO, make sure that it is recorded. So, because if you go in, as I had a person last year, we were really the first time we were implementing it, they said he couldn't vote. And he happened to call me, Sister, you told me. I said, baby, I'll be there, okay? So, I'm, I'm, I'm a whole official and I work in the main building. So, what happened is they have to supposedly, we're working on it, be off of parole. There should be a statement that ex-felon has that he or she can present. So that's important. So I had to deal with, at that time, the providing judge, and she said, well, he can't do that. I said, yes, he can. And we are not going anywhere. And I asked him, I said, I don't want you to violate, so you need to go sit down, and I'm going to fight this fight. And he ended up getting able to vote. They went through a whole lot of questions. Because your social security number follows you. And that is why it was, well, it says, sir, you, you and we don't show you. And I'm like, we're going to make calls. And I make calls. So they need to know their rights as well. You, you can go there and they can say what you can't do. Uh-uh. You need to know what you can do. But start with your parole off. So the day you are off of parole, you get your papers. Get things lined up. And um, we do have... Um, um, I think it's 14 sites for um, uh, elections. So early voting, we just mentioned, is getting ready to get started, and the absentee things too. So, and um, I, I have a night vision problem, so I can't stay too long. And I live far west, but it's easy to do. You can request this online, and they'll, they'll mail it to you. And it really does not take a lot to do. Take the time. This. People don't realize your local elections, your state elections are very important. They're what control Washington. Mm -hmm. We spend so much time on our president, where he may not be president, if we did what we need to do down in this area. So in questions, um, um, there's some people that know me, AK, Sister Sarah, it's easy. I made it visible for my grandchildren, 610-8258, right down the middle. If you have an old-fashioned phone, six one zero eight two five. So, any questions? Um, they can get hold of me. Thank you. So, anybody, if you want to do something tonight, I can give you this, and you can mail it in. Somebody give a hand clap for Sister Sarah. Thank you all again for having me, and hope I didn't bore you too much. Thank you for Wings for Life, Goose for having me. Y'all have a blessed evening. So what do you guys think? Awesome. So can we get a round of applause for the kitchen, Miss Dorothy and Isabella? Uh, Margie, she's not here, but we'll give her a round of applause for the arts and crafts. I thank you all for coming. Um, we have a few announcements, but I want to introduce Ms. Victoria. She's our, our project manager for Wings for Life. Uh, round of applause, please.
just it's it's pro it's programs, but no one no one really cares that much. Um, I just wanted to give a quick announcement about our DWI pro prevention program starting next week. Um, I'm still encouraging all of you all to attend. Um, this program is just something that we are getting grant money for, uh, but the dinners are still going to be provided. The programming is still going to be provided. I really encourage all of you guys to even sign up, uh, be one of our 50, 50 participants, um, so that we can keep that grant money coming. So please continue to join us. It's going to look a little different, but I just encourage you to sign up for that program. Uh, it's just going to be a quick sign-up sheet. That's really it. Uh, so we're able to kind of track your progress with us. Um, but I do thank you all for your dedication. I think Devante, that was amazing. It was uh, an interesting way to look at the politics. So thank you, Devante, and thank you all for being here. All right, hope to see you guys next week.